Good evening and welcome to Wine Webinars. Welcome to our Wine Lenten Book Club. We are reading 10 Promises of Jesus, Stories in Scripture, Reflections about Suffering and Joy. Tonight we are joined with Kelly Walquist and really excited to bring you the Promise 3 featured amazing woman, Deb, Had Deb Hadley. Deb, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Allison. It's fun to be on. Thank you. We can't wait to hear from you. I know that my group, uh, the Wicked Awesome Wine Girls, we did the, this um, on Monday, and they're just, they were just so moved by your story, by your strength to share it. So again, thrilled to have you here, and we can't wait to hear more from you. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight in the chat. As you know, just a couple of really quick housekeeping. Um, the chat is over there. If you have any questions, for uh, Deb or Kelly or myself, there's a big question mark like in a thought bubble. Put the questions in there so we don't miss it. Sometimes in the chat, things get going so quick that we miss, we could miss your questions. So make sure questions specifically for us go there. Um, there's no polls tonight, but if you see that little present in there is a little bit about wine memberships. Wine is a nonprofit organization and support from wonderful people like you and our wine members keep the wine flowing, we like to say. There's more information in there. One of the great benefits of being a wine member, besides being a part of the new evangelization and the work of wine, is that you can, um, you're, you are, yes, try that again in English, Allison. <laughs> it's been a very long day. You can get either five, 10, 15, or even 20% off, depending on which level of membership that you choose for uh, books or for, specific um, events. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now <laughs> and welcome on Kelly and Deb. Well, <laughs> We're awesome going to be here at Promise 3 and 4. So welcome and let's just jump right jump right in. Who, who gets to start in prayer? Are we throwing, are you going Deb? I think I've already done enough talking, so you two can toss a good I'll, rock, I'll paper, scissors, shoot. I'll start in prayer, and we'll have Deb end in prayer. Sounds good. We'll go like that. So, hi, ladies. It's so great to have you here again. It's awesome to be here, and I, I love seeing everybody talking. We got a couple carols, which is great. Name means joy. Good name. And Linda <laughs> Lee Miller, nice to have you here. Susie. Susie Streeter from Colorado. Hi, Susie. How are you? Sue, Angie, and Angela Koenig. I don't know if your ears were just ringing, but right before we went live, we were talking about you. So we might talk about you a little bit on here. So get ready uh, to hear yourself talk about it in a good way. So um, let's start in prayer, and then we'll throw it back over to Allison and dive in, and then we'll dive into Deb's head and her heart. Um, <laughs> the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious God, thank you for bringing us together on this evening. Thank you for uniting us as sisters in Christ. Thank you for giving us all the gifts that you have bestowed upon us, and especially for giving us your peace and your joy, and for giving us one another who can work together uh, to support each other so that we can make that joy complete in you. We ask you to send your spirit down upon us, down upon each and every woman that is with us here tonight, down upon those who can't join us tonight, but are but are entering into your 10 promises. And we ask you to open the ears of our heart, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us tonight. Send your blessing down upon um, our wonderful guest, Deb Hadley. And we pray this all in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Woohoo. All right. Now, so Miss Allison, I'm going to yes, put you on the big screen, make myself oh. smaller, and then we'll kind of just toggle, and whoever's talking gets to be real, real big. Oh, that's that's a little too much, Allison. Um, <laughs> So promise three, we're looking at Luke 11, nine through 13, ask and you shall receive. And I tell you, ask and you receive, seek you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asked for a fish or hand him a scorpion when he asked for an egg? If then you who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven 
give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And that is the, the framework for promise three. We're on page 34 if you're reading along with us. And the first thing I want to just look at is Marge jumps in with this idea that I think I'd love to hear from you both, Kelly and Deb, your thoughts on. She, basically, she's saying um, that she'd asked for God, uh, asked her parents for the spike. Like she really wanted something and she kind of begged for it. And then she didn't get it and she was devastated. She got something else which turned out to be better. And so the question for everybody, that kind of overarching question here from the beginning of this, have you ever asked either your boss, God, um, your spouse, your parents for something that you really, really thought you wanted and then in the end got something very surprising but absolutely was the best thing for you to get? Can you relate to that in any way? No, not at all. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Kelly. Next. <laughs> that pretty much sums up your uh, my life, right? Uh, no, Deb, I, I we'll throw it to you. Let you. Uh, well, you know when it, I have to think this through a little bit. You know, I'm kind of on the spot. But um, what that made me think about is uh, in in my faith, um, so often feeling that. Um, you know, if you need something, what do you do? We'll pray to God about that. You know, oh yeah, pray about that. You know, uh, we'd like to win the game. Well, you should pray about that. You know, or I really want to get the job. Well, you should pray about that. I hope someone is healed. You should really pray about that. And so praying about that for me at one time in my life was that I was going to pray about that and then he would listen and then I would get it. And so I think I had a, a big misunderstanding with that. And a funny story back from when I was younger, I remember um, I really wanted a pair of white Nike. Ooh, I'm big on that screen. I wanted a pair of, of white Nike tennis shoes uh, with those red stripes, you know, and that oh, little yeah. blue wedge. I really wanted that. And uh, well, I just, what do you do? I'm going to pray on that. And like, I was so specific in my prayer that, I mean, I wanted the white tennis shoes. I wanted them in my closet because I knew if I would get those that, I would be one of the cool kids and I would look so neat. And like life would be better if I could get those tennis shoes. And uh, and I prayed and I actually wanted them there Friday morning. I remember I wanted them there Friday morning and I Friday morning came and I opened up my closet and the night they were not there. And I, yeah, I was a little bit shocked about that. And uh, I, I, I was really disappointed because I prayed and I didn't get those Nike tennis shoes. Um, I often think, boy, what if I would have gotten those Nike tennis shoes? And then my God would have been the God where he just gives me gifts and he just gives me things that I want when I want them. And a big misconception, I think that was one of my big misconceptions in life is that, um, you know, when we pray to God and when we believe in God and we do everything right and when we, you know, that good things will happen, but then hardships really do happen uh, in our lives. And that is really he, when he really shows up bigger than we can never imagine uh, that he's always there. So I don't know. That's that's what crossed my mind. Um, but I think my my whole life that doors have opened or doors have closed that have slammed shut really hard, and then a new door has opened that's been way more beautiful uh, than the one that slammed. But it's so painful at the time. You don't you can't see any of the beauty in it and. We just have to come to a point of complete trust and complete surrender and just, you know, Lord, um, I, I, you know, someone said once, now who was it, Kelly and Allison, who said, don't waste this suffering. Like, don't waste yeah. this well, suffering. Fulton, Fulton, Archbishop Fulton Sheen said that there's so much wasted suffering in hospitals if we only knew how much yeah. suffering was being wasted. You know, yeah. we, and so that's so something much. I... I always think of like, though, this is pretty deep suffering, Lord. I'm not going to waste it. And, you know, show me that beauty will come from this. So, well, and I like it. I mean, it's we're falling back on four line Maria. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. When the Lord closes a door somewhere, he opens a window. And it's so mm -hmm. very true. What what struck me um, from that from that is the whole um, I was the same way about I'm just going to ask. And sometimes I'm, I'm timid in asking for my prayer. We can talk about that as well. 
but it's like, okay, I'll ask. Like, I'll ask for those Nikes with the red stripe. I had them. It took me a long time to get them with, but it, they look so good with the Jordache jeans. Um, <laughs> and then you were cool and your life was so good because you had that. <laughs> I actually think that the first ones I got were the light blue stripe. Remember when they came out with that? Oh, I wasn't, I didn't have the red stripe. Which they was weren't quite cool. as cool, but they were nice. They were nice. Not quite yeah. as cool. But uh, what I just, even in hearing you speak, this is what hit me is it's um, the ask, the seek and the knock. So it's like, we just ask, like make them show up in my, in my, you know, closet on Friday morning, but these are verbs. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. Jesus is saying, be part of this. You know, I mean, there's so much that we have to do to surrender and to trust, but we don't just surrender and trust and not act upon it. He's asking us to ask. He's asking us to seek, to go looking for it, you know, and I mean, just think of what that means, uh, you know, playing hide and seek, that anticipating mm -hmm. seeking something and then to knock. And what are you doing when you're knocking? You're, you're asking and seek, you're asking and seeking to come into something, right? To get something greater. So um, I think I, I, I can, I feel that same way. Like, I think I sometimes get stuck in the two parts. Number one, the fear of asking. I think Mar talks about that, right? Like, oh, I don't know that God can do it. Or, And then the second part of um, kind of stopping there. Like I ask and then, I'm, and then I don't bug him. He's probably mm -hmm. like, just don't bug me. <laughs> Come seek. Come seek a little bit. So. But I think too, as you know, we mature and get older, we realize that prayers don't work that way. Right. That through the hardships in my life, um, I not only ask and seek, but I literally bust the door down, two hands banging on the door, like you know, Lord, uh, you know, help me. I need you. I need to hear you. I need to see you. You know, I, I open my heart to you, and I, I literally knock the door down uh, because it's such a different level. It's not a ask seek because of what I want and for like material needs or things, but it's such a deep spiritual need, you know, that longing of um, healing and feeling his love and feeling his presence and understanding purpose. And when I think I come to him asking and seeking and knocking so open to what he wants to do in my life, not what I need, but what he wants to do through me and for me to open up and be that vessel for him, that is when I feel like the door just opens and he, and you just feel his love flood in because it's no longer about, I want this on um, this day right here in this color, you know, uh, it's no longer like that. It's like, you know, Lord, uh, use me and, uh, um, and flood into me. And I, that's when I think the, the doors just open and that beautiful relationship builds. I think for for me, like the it's the long the long picture. Like I remember, um, I got pregnant and I had my son Ian, and then um, my next pregnancy I lost um, to a, an ectopic, a very serious one that actually nearly took my life. And then I got pregnant again, and I remember um, just begging the Lord, please let this pregnancy be okay, please. And like and feeling like him and I had this great relationship. Like there was no way he was going to let something happen to this baby. Like he preserved my life. He had to have had a reason. And then I lost that child to an, um, a miscarriage. And then I became afraid to ask, to pray, to put myself back out there, be vulnerable to God. Because I'm like, well, I obviously don't get what I like, what I want. So either he's not real or he's really mad at me or, and I, I didn't understand at that point at all how prayer worked, God's will, the surrender. I didn't know anything about that. And then we were blessed with another child um, after that, but he came early. And so when it came time, almost 10 years later to decide, okay, we're at that point, like, Lord, we're open to life, whatever you want. When we decided to adopt, it was only in hindsight that I realized that that was the prayer that God, like that was what God had for our family. That's what God wanted for us. Like he says in the, in the Psalms, like he delights in giving your heart's desire. Well, I had that desire in my heart when I was in eighth grade. I told my mom I was going to adopt a child where the world considered unadoptable. But then life happened and I completely forgot that dream. But God had kept it in my heart, that desire there. But I know that the things that happened and the no's that he gave were for this ultimate, beautiful, huge yes in my family. But it's that long game that I have a hard time with, like mm -hmm. that waiting for his answer, for his purpose to be fulfilled. You know, his 
his sheer goodness. I love Kelly, how you say that his, for that to all happen, I had to be patient and let all those virtues that he wants to grow in me and that trust and understanding. But had you told me that at 22, I've been like, no, no, I just want the baby now. Like mm -hmm. I just want this baby. That's all I want. Cause I don't want the pain. I don't want to suffer through this. I want what I want now. Was this so. the chapter where she was talking about the green, the bike? Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry. I, I know there's only two chapters. I'm getting them confused, but yeah. So there you go. You, you wanted the, you wanted the fancy banana seat bike and you got that. And Deb, you wanted those Nike shoes for running and look what he's, look at the shoes he's put you in now and where you're going. The places, oh, the places you are running to. The places will go. <laughs> uh, you know what I think too, in that when we, when we talk about asking God, and so often um, we kind of fear like asking him, like, I don't want to bug you, you know, kind of thing. And I remember I was in a car with Mother Assumpta Long and Sister Joseph Andrew. And Sister Joseph's Mother Assumpta was in the back. And um, uh, Sister Joseph Andrew was sitting in the front seat. And I was telling them that I kind of felt guilty praying to the Lord to help me run a Bible study with like 633 people um, when there are people in China being persecuted for their faith. And in an instant, Mother Assumpta took off that seatbelt. It just went fling, and she got up over the seat, both arms like this. And she looked at me and she said, "Hun, God loves to be God. And he's good at it. It's his job. You just let him do it. And that has stuck with me for so long that we have to realize that Jesus is telling us, and I tell you. That's, where, that's how the sentence starts. And I tell you ask seek knock he's telling us hey this is my job i love this deb i want you pounding with both fists when you're knocking mm -hmm. bring it on jesus is saying bring it on girl <laughs> bring it on yeah and i think too he was pretty probably you know thinking it was pretty cute that i would come to him for those shoes and that I trusted that he could do that. And, uh, you know, I, I think for the Lord, no small thing, you know, helping me with this Bible camp, helping me pass this test, helping me, you know, whatever it is that, you know, that he, it pleases him when we bring it to him. And he's not judging us going, you know, like, seriously, you think you're going to get those Nike tennis shoes? Right. I think he's, I think he's humored by it. <laughs> that, <laughs> that he's like, hmm. Yeah. All right. Keep keep asking. You know. Keep keep ask, Keep trying different avenues on that one. But well, uh, you know, and in prayer and kind of as in trust. So if we trust in God and those little tiny things in our life, how much more are we able to trust in Him when something big rocks our world? So when you're praying to Him for those little tiny things throughout the day, how much more are you going to go to Him when your world is rocked and you need Him? You know. Right. So. Well, before we jump into Deb, how your world was rocked, um, there's a there's a sentence in here that we actually pulled out for one of our journal questions, where you talked you defined yourself as a surface Catholic. I think a lot of us can relate to that um, that feeling that those the characteristics of what it meant to be a, a, a surface Catholic. I'd love to know from people here tonight what what you what what comes to your mind when you hear surface Catholic. And Deb, I'd like to know from you what what did you mean by that specifically in relation to your own life? Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of asking for the Lord for. Uh, Nike tennis shoes with a red stripe. <laughs> That's what it kind of all goes together. It all is in that bunch. Um, well, I'm I'm a cradle Catholic, and I honestly I hadn't heard that term until I became part of the wine bunch. And uh, you know, with wine, and we talked. They talked about. I think Barbara Heil talked about being a cradle Catholic, and I realized that I I am a cradle Catholic. And um, there's. There's privilege in being a cradle Catholic, but then there's also, um, like, I'm glad that my parents were Catholic. But cradle Catholic, I was born in, I was born Catholic. My parents were Catholic. If they were, if they were some anything else, I would have been that. So I was born Catholic, and to be Catholic and to have faith, we went to church on Sundays. You know, we would march up to the front of the church. And we would, you know, kicking and screaming, whatever, it wouldn't matter. Every Sunday we were going to church, you know, 
we received every sacrament that we could receive. And then we had confession before all those major holidays. We always had to go stand and go do that. Um, religion class was on Wednesdays and um, bless us, the Lord, for these are gifts, which we, we prayed before we ate. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, you know, we would do that, you know, even like, you know, just a Father, Son, Holy Spirit, try to do it really fast, you know, just kind of. But we went through all the motions of what I thought that faith was, um, you know, and, and every night as a family, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, you know, with my brothers and we would, God bless mommy, God bless dad, like, you know, we, we, daddy, God, but we would do the whole thing. And for me, I just, um, my, most of my friends were Catholic, some were Lutheran, but that, that is really what faith was for me. And, um, it wasn't until, and, and honestly, then as an adult, I did the same thing to my kids. You know, they went to church. I taught religious class. They went to religious class. I mean, like we, they did the same upbringing I did. And, and I'm grateful for it because it, it grounded me in the faith and I, I, I definitely knew of the Lord, but what was missing in my life was that personal relationship, thinking that I could uh, ask, seek and knock, knowing that he was there with me. And um, I remember specifically when uh, my daughter, it was June 5th, 2013, when uh, my daughter Keely was supposed to be coming home. She was a school teacher and she had just resigned from her teaching job down at Martin County West. And she had going away parties with all of her students and her teachers. And she had packed her car up to come home. She was going to start teaching summer school in Sleepy Eye, where we were living. And we were planning a wedding. She was getting married in January. So that's why she had retired or resigned. And so we were so excited. And then she didn't come home. And, um, you know, panic strikes. And, you know, I remember... Uh, we knew that she she was diagnosed with epilepsy just three years prior. Um, I knew she had a seizure. Um, some of her friends had found her, and I knew the ambulance was coming to get her, that we would meet at the hospital in Fairmont, which we had done before. And so as we were driving down, I remember just, I remember saying to my son, Tyler, it's not good, Tyler, you just got to pray, you just got to pray. And I remember being in the car driving down and praying and, you know, like, dear Lord, just let her be okay. Just let her be okay. Almost bargaining. Like, I promise, you know, like, just, just let her be okay. You know, our father, Hail Mary, you know, Mother Mary, I know that you're with me. And, and that's when I received the phone call from a police officer um, that had asked me if I was Kaylee's mother. And then you just, you just like, you know, don't say it. Don't, 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 don't even say it. And I remember when he had told me she didn't make it, um, like everything just went black in my world. And I remember like, what do you pray for when it's, it's just gone? And I couldn't get over that feeling of not only that she was gone, but like, I didn't even know if God knew that this had happened. I didn't know if he was there. I didn't, I didn't know him. And then I just even questioned whether he existed. Um, I went through the motions of thinking like you, Allison, I'm being punished. I'm sure that I'm being punished. Man, I've done some crappy things in my life and I'm being punished. And uh, it was just a horrific, horrific journey. Um, and that's when I realized I was a surface Catholic. Like I showed up in a pew. I pick, I, and, uh, and I didn't do anything extra in really spending time with him. I think one of the greatest things that you can do is, is read scripture. And I didn't do that at all. And um, I got a daily devotional that I started reading. I started um, reading the scripture that it led me to. I started going all over the Bible. And uh, um, I just prayed to the Lord that he, like, I wanted to feel him. I wanted to know his presence. I wanted to um, I wanted to find purpose. I wanted to understand. And uh, I remember like being on my knees and, and just crying so hard and not understanding. Um, but the, what started to really help me was I started to, to thank him when I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to thank him. And I started thanking him that I could be her mom and that, um, that I got her for 24 years and other people don't get that. And I just, I started thanking him for everything and, and all the kids and, it, and who I still had in my life. And, uh, and I tell you from that encounter, the doors that he opened for me and the absolutely amazing people that 
God sent into my life. And another thing that I, um, well, I'll tell that a little bit later, but um, someone was actually, oh, I'll get to that part later. Um, that'll take us to a different place because it, it just leads into the story so well. Um, but it was actually um, when uh, Chris in the book, uh, she showed up at my door. And do you want me to go into that part of the story when she showed up? And so um, I found that I, I was thanking God, but I didn't know what to pray for. In fact, I felt like I needed a beginner, like a prayer book for dummies, because I just didn't know how to pray. I'm like, what do I, she's not here. I can't, and that's all I wanted was her to be here. And um, Chris was an acquaintance of mine. Um, I hadn't seen her for six years. She was a 4-H mom. I ran the 4-H program. And all I knew from her is that she was a very strong Catholic. She ended her phone message on her machine with, and God bless you. And she had seven children that she homeschooled herself and that they went to church every day. And it was just like, she was like way better than me. You know, like she was, she, she was really, she was really a godly woman. And um, she had, you know, messaged me to come over to visit with me. And I honestly didn't want her to come because she had all seven of her kids and she did everything right. And my daughter was not here and I was, I did everything wrong. And I, I really was feeling a lot of shame and guilt that came out. And um, finally I agreed to let her come and she came over and she, she just said, um, the Lord's asked me to come and pray with you. Do you accept not knowing if I was a Christian, not knowing my faith, not of any kind. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I believed her. I, I believed her. And so some things that she did for me uh, in my grief, which was excellent, is that um, she listened. She didn't come to try to fix me. Um, and she had said boldly on her part that she had seen people grieve in their lifetime, but never to the extent that I was grieving. And she asked me, and she'd never lost a child. So how does she know? You know, but she just, she, and we talk about, we laugh about it now, how bold she was. Um, everything that she did was so completely Holy Spirit driven and she has no idea what she said or, or what even happened. I mean, it was just, it's like an out of body experience. Um, but I, I was, I was suffering from what's called complicated grief. It's like, it was the loss of Keely, but it, there was so much shame and guilt and regret that was underneath that, that was weighing me down and why I was feeling I was punished. And a lot of it had to do with my my uh, my divorce to her dad, and I felt very responsible. I she didn't get to live with him, and honestly, every every bad word or bad argument that Kaylee and I got into, I think that's all I thought about. You know, I couldn't think of anything good, and so I was suffering from that. But she listened, and um, one thing too, when I spilt everything out and and all of my sins, and and I mean, I like it was a true confession, and it does say in the Bible too. You know, like to confess to someone else. Um, but her, the, you know, she just looked at me and, and she just said, um, oh, so you're not perfect. And I was like, oh my gosh. She goes, you, you come off in every part of your life as you're perfect. You have it all together. And, and when you look back, think about your life. If people could just look at you like Allison, even the story you just shared, I had no idea that that happened, you know, you look at Kelly and look at the, you know, what she's been able to build and, and we don't know the hardships that people carry. Uh, and we have to remember that, that everybody is broken in some way, shape or form, they're broken. Um, and then after she was done listening and she, you know, she's like, you're a sinner, just like the rest of us and how much God loved me. And, and, and then she wrapped her arms around me. And when she asked me to pray, I thought I was going to get an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be. You know, I did. And I, I which I think are super important. I, I think they're extremely important. And uh, if you know the meaning behind them, uh, you know, I, I think they're they're beautiful. And they're, I, I love them. But this was a prayer where she wrapped her arms around me. And she prayed with me so intently that I felt the Holy Spirit jump. Like I felt it leap inside of me. Um almost like Mary and Elizabeth. It was like, whoo, I, I did. I felt it jump. And I, I realized that I didn't know him. Like what I was missing was him like that. And I knew I wanted what she had. I knew what she had with God was different than what I had. And I wanted what she had. 
And that kind of was like, that was it. And so it was, and then, then the doors just kept opening and I had even questioned my Catholic faith. I was questioning it. I had even gone and gone to some other churches thinking that I just want to be inspired. I just want to be like, well, you know, and, and I, I just want to, you know, like evangelize and, and, um, and I kept getting pulled back to the Catholic church. I just kept getting pulled back to the Catholic church. And then Chris comes as a Catholic woman who was like what she did to me. And then <clears throat> that's when the doors started opening and the <clears throat> Catholic women and the events and the things that I um, were, were given to me uh, just turned me on fire, um, literally uh, for my faith. And it's so, so it's so beautiful to see how you go from surface surface to depth. Mm -hmm. And you know, Allison, you said about God's plan of sheer goodness. I can't take those as my words. You know, I mean that's it's the catechism. Um, but it's the first paragraph of the catechism that God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to share in his own blessed life, which is beautiful mm -hmm. in itself. But then the next part is that um, and that for that reason, God uses every moment and every opportunity to draw man close to him, right? So everything that brings us closer to God is his mercy. And sometimes we don't see that until we're out of it. And now Deb, you're, and, you know, or you're stand, you're not in the throes of it. Let's say that you're, you're probably never completely out of it, but you're not in the throes of it. Wait, I'm not in the fire. <laughs> you're not, yeah, right. You're stepping out and you can, you're looking at it and you're thinking, oh Lord, Sending that crazy Catholic woman with all those kids being homeschooled, what what a mercy that was for me. You know, everything that's and just the the things that are happening in your life um are God's mercy. You know, mercy is love when it encounters suffering. Um yeah. as long as we're on this earth, we're suffering. Why? Because yeah. we're not in love, which is Father, Son, and Spirit, right? I don't mean that we're suffering under, you know heavy suffering some of us through different periods but ultimately yeah. our hearts are right restless until they rest in thee and so anything he uses um to draw us closer to him is his mercy and his love mm -hmm. and uh really quick i when i when i you know just was reading your story again and i know your story very well we'll have to tell them how i know your story so well that's what i was going to get into and i'm like oh, i can't I, even I, go there i doctor um yeah. but um I was, I just thought of, there's, a, there was a man who, um, of happy memory now has gone to be with the Lord, but he was probably about 18 years ago, um, very rough life and was in a motorcycle accident that left him as a quadriplegic. He, mm -hmm. his life changed, um, by the people, by the incident, uh, by the people God put in his path during that. And then he went to every one of the Bible studies we ran through the great adventure. Every one. He never missed a night. He was part of the Catechetical Institute. Never missed a night. And there was one night when one of our instructors couldn't, he <laughs> kind of fell asleep. Go figure, right before he's supposed to do something. Dumb. <laughs> he fell asleep on the couch or something and couldn't make it. And he felt so bad. But by the grace of God, God has a plan of sheer goodness. We had Michael in that time get up and tell his story. Mm -hmm. And he told these people who were studying to go deeper in their faith that his faith grew exponentially. He, he would give anything to have that motorcycle accident again because mm -hmm. it brought him so much cl closer to God. Yeah. So when you hear that, there there is a reason for everything. And, um, you know, not God doesn't will us, obviously, to to suffer but he allows it and mm -hmm. he you know all things work work for good for those who love him and he's going to do everything to bring him to to us to him and when i look at you and your story um yeah he's got you running toward him in those red nike shoes yeah I, i'm telling you it's <laughs> exactly i know it's so <laughs> it's, yeah. it's amazing Thing. And so, yeah, and I, I love that you share your heart and you share that suffering. And Allison, you too. Thanks for, thank you for sharing that. Um, that's the beauty of wine, to be able to enter into that with our sisters and to grow and to help heal one another. So. Yeah. And how remarkable that the, by sheer God's right? We are reading this week about Tyler 
and you know, this is the anniversary again our sorrow our sorrow for your loss and the, all these women who read your story this week we sold over 150 of these books right so this week over 150 women were reading your story and lifting you in prayer like that that's God at work like that's the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit that doesn't happen by accident how incredible was that right mm -hmm. um so and I, and I feel, and I shouldn't be on here tonight, but we have a snowstorm. And so my meeting that I had got canceled. And so, you know, what, you know, to be upset about a snowstorm, but then it allowed me um, to be on, on here. And yeah. And, uh, um, you know, my, my story with Tyler. So I, I emerged myself in, in faith. I started to go to, I, I was too sick to work. So I started going to daily mass like every day. I'd never gone to daily mass. It just wasn't something Well, I worked. And I just, I went to church on Sundays. That's what I did. And uh, so I, I started going to daily mass. Um, I started going to confession more often. Um, I started reading my Bible. I really dug in. And then I went to a women's a uh, conference in the city it's called Set Apart. And um, it was uh, on March uh, 7th. It was March 7th was the day of the conference. And um, previous to that, um, March 5th was Kaylee's nine month anniversary into heaven. And um, it was so hard. And I think it was for all of us because she'd been gone for nine months and maybe because it takes nine months to have a, a child. But um, my mom and dad and my husband and my stepson, Josh, and my stepdaughter, Jesse, and she had three little boys at the time, and my son, Tyler, we were all together. And we we were going to, you know, those anniversaries are going to come. So we just hit it head on. And I remember hugging Tyler and just telling him that um, I felt joy. I said, Tyler, I feel joy. Like, I feel the Lord. And I have to tell you, a beautiful thing that, thing that happened in those nine months and after Keeley's uh, dying um, was that we just, as a family, grew deeper in faith, especially Tyler and I. You know, I got him a devotional. I got him, you know, we pulled out the Bible. We started talking about heaven. We started digging deeper into faith. Um, I wrapped my arms around him and prayed with him the way I the way I was prayed. And he, he melted like putty in my arms and He's like, mom, that felt so good. And I go, I know, isn't that just so awesome? You know, and and I I remember that, you know, uh, his friends would say to me, yeah, we'd say, Where ha where's Hadley? Oh, because he was in college. Oh, he's in his room talking to his mom. Like he was out, you know, he was like talking to his mom, like we would pray at night. And so it really grew something beautiful, you know, in us too. And I remember, um, you know, Tyler and I talking about heaven and um, that I knew that if there was any place that he'd ever wanted to be right then and there, he would want to be with her and that he wasn't afraid and what it was like. And it was, we just simply had amazing talks. And, you know, on March 5th, I had told him that I, I just, you know, it, it's when I think back of how the Holy Spirit intervenes, but I remember he was going to take off for college and I like, like, I wrapped my arms around him. He's like six, two, you know, and I, I was like, Tyler, okay, you got to listen up here. You know, I'm like, if the Lord should choose to take you to heaven, cause you know, that does happen. You know, he, you know, Kaylee, Kay, and I don't like to always use the word take, but I'm just going to use it in this situation. But you know, like, you know, Kaylee, she left without any warning. And so you never know, but if, if that should happen, just know that um, I'm going to have to have signs because I'm just, I'm not going to make it. So I'm going to have to have signs. And I said, Kaylee gave me a purple petunia. So you're going to have to like step up on that. He's like, oh yeah, mom, I'll send you a sign, you know? And, and I said, Ty, you know what? I said, and if the Lord should choose to bring you to heaven, um, I'm not going to feel any guilt for you because you're spoiled rotten. Like I, I, I'm like, I couldn't have been a better mom to you. I said, I couldn't love you more. I, I, I told him, I go, you are like one of the greatest gifts that uh, the Lord could have ever given me how blessed I am to have you. And um, I remember like he was going to take off, he kissed me on the cheek and I'm like, Oh no, no, you got to kiss me on the lips. And my, and he did, cause we did that. And um, my husband's like, what is wrong with you? You know? And, and it was like, I'm like giving him a send off. And uh, I just said, you know, I don't want to leave anything unspoken. I just want you guys to know what's on my heart and what's on my mind. And it's just really important to me. And um, then I went up to the set apart conference, set apart, you know, what is, how does he set us apart? So what is he setting us apart for? And um, the craziest thing is that I was with um, about 
mm, a dozen women at this conference and we went out to eat. Now this is March 7th. We went out to eat and I, and I didn't really know them. They all belong to like a covenant type church, assembly of God type church, different churches. None of them were Catholic that were at the table, except for me. I was there with my sister-in-law and the gal next to me was super nice. And she started saying all these things about the Catholic church and my Catholic faith. And, and I remember saying, cow, you really know, you really know a lot about the Catholic faith. And she goes, well, yeah, because my brother wanted to be Catholic and I did everything in my power to make sure that didn't happen. And that was the first time that I had ever heard my faith attacked. I just couldn't even believe it. And, and, and I couldn't defend myself because I was a surface Catholic, you see, and I was building a relationship with God, but why do we do all these things? I mean, we do them because we're told we do them when we do them. And so I remember leaving there and I remember thinking at that moment, you know what, if I'm going to be Catholic, I'm going to know doggone well why I'm Catholic. But if I'm not going to be Catholic, then I'm going to know doggone well why I'm not. And I'm like, and I remember praying, Lord, you know what, help me to understand this religion, open up my heart so I can understand this religion. And it ended up um, probably precisely at that time when I, we were sitting there talking about this. Um, I, another crazy thing, I had a dream about Kaylee. And so one of the ladies at the table deciphers dreams, you know, I'm like, oh, so they go, you should ride back with her. And on the way back, she talked about the number seven how it, it in the Bible and uh, in Revelations and all about number seven and how it's just perfect, the number seven. And I couldn't understand why she was talking about the number seven because number seven had nothing to do with Keely. She passed on the fifth. I have, it, and it was probably precisely at that time um, that um, the accident occurred on the seventh in Sleepy Eye. And there's so many things that she said about the seventh that I think back and I look back and. Um, we were at the hotel then that night when my husband had called in and just told me that there was a really bad accident in Sleepy Eye. And, and I right away said, you know, like, well, where's Tyler? Like right away, you know, I think that's a mother's thing. Your mind just goes to that. And he's like, I don't know. He was sitting here on the couch and fast forward. It was, you know, I got distracted with sharing signs that Keely had given me with purple petunias with people. My sister-in-law did everything she could to like, just make me feel comfortable because I was still really it was nine months and two days after Kaylee passed, I was still really raw. I was really still struggling. And um, and that's when I tried calling Tyler. I came back and his, I hadn't, I texted him and I called him and I ended up calling the police station. And that's when I found that um, uh, the police officer had told me that he didn't make it. And um, I remember um, falling, like literally I was in the bathroom and I remember just falling to the ground and uh, I was just, I, I was, I just, I, I went, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And it just was so loud. And um, I was like screaming it. And I was just like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't, do it, I can't, I can't. Like I was breaking. And it was just so different because I felt him. Like I felt him like pick me right up off the floor. I knew I wasn't alone. And he was just like, just focus on me and not the storm, just focus on me. And I remember then um, being driven to my home and sleep by the woman who was said that about the Catholic. Um, she's one of my very good friends. She gave me one of the biggest gifts when she said that about my religion, because it made me dig into it, you know? So instead of being mad and bitter, I, I used that, but, and she's a dear friend. And I remember driving home and uh, she had written me this long letter and she said the whole way home, I just thanked the Lord. I just kept thanking him for Kaylee and thanking him for Tyler and that I could be their mother. And that, and she said, it, because I knew my mind, I, I just focused on him, everything in him. I, I, Lord, I know you love me. I know you're going to help me through this. And I knew he needed me because there are four boys died in that accident. And I knew that he needed me to be a warrior for him to help these other families and all these kids that lost their best friends and all these people who didn't understand like how do you lose two kids in nine months and then three other boys in the small community and people were mad at god yeah how, they were mad at him and he needed me to stand up for him and to pray with these families and let them know that we were going to get through this and um 
And he, honestly, he, uh, I spoke at his few Tyler's funeral where Kaylee's, I was drug up the aisle and a Holy Spirit moment that we were going to trust in his plan, even though we didn't, even though we didn't understand it, that we're all God's children. Even my children are his children and they were on ours for just a, a short amount of time. And that we're, you know, to let go and trust God that he would bring purpose, even if it was that we all grab onto him right now, that we use this suffering that we're in to open our hearts to him, uh, to save our souls so that we can get to the kingdom. And, um, and so like, I felt him at work right away in, in my heart and soul. And, uh, after that, I knew he wanted me to speak about it. And I had, I, I did, I took a speaking class. I lost my voice for almost uh, for the longest time. Um, but I took a, a speaking class and, uh, I recorded, I got, they recorded me doing a video and I just called it, it was a 10 minute video. That's what it was. So, and I'm skipping right over Tyler. Um, cause I want to get to my Kelly story just for, for time's sake. But, um, but I had, they, this videographer was going to videotape us, um, if we wanted to. And so Chris, the gal who prayed with me decided we took this class at the national speakers Academy. So I drive to the cities every day for a year or every week, every once a month for a year, because I was going to speak, you know, and uh, we drove separately that day. And she said, um, well, are you going to get videoed? And I'm like, absolutely not. And she's like, what? I go, no, I, I don't have, I haven't practiced. I don't have anything down. I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And she goes, well, you have nothing to lose. It's for free. You could do it. And I remember I go, well, I had this incident happen to me in the grocery store with this lady by the zucchinis. And I said, I could tell that story, but I don't have a beginning or an end. So if I get off the phone with you, and I can at least think it through, then I can, I, I could do that story. I could tell it. And so let me get up. So literally I was almost to my class. So I'm trying to think of the story. And so then they videotaped me doing this. And I just called it my amazing life, finding God through the midst of the storm. And um, I had that video actually. So when I got the recording back of it, I didn't even open it up for the longest time because I was, I didn't want to watch it. I just thought that's going to be awful. And then one night at about two in the morning, when I felt the Lord prompting me, I opened that video and I watched it and I thought, Oh, that's, that's not too bad. That's pretty good actually. And I could talk and I hadn't been talking. I mean, I, my voice was pretty clear. And so I put it on my Facebook page and I just said, I feel like the Lord wants me to, um, I feel like the Lord wants me to speak. And so if, if you know anyone who would like a speaker, here's, here's my story. And I put it out there. And then that video got into the hands of Kelly and what, what is so crazy is when you ask the Lord, Lord, I want to know more about my faith. And then he brings Chris to pray with me, who's Catholic. And I know I want what she has. And then it, my video gets into the hand of Kelly, who has the most dynamic, Catholic, enthusiastic, on fire, new evangelization I, I, I can't even explain it because what I knew of my Catholic faith wasn't what I saw when I was introduced to Kelly. And, uh, and, oh, I can't hear you now. I got this video saying, oh, this person is a speaker or anything like that. It was 11 o'clock at night and sister Lisa sent me this video through Facebook you know, and I never check Facebook messages ever, ever. I got people are messaging me. I mean, there's, I get smoke signals. I get everything. I mean, I don't check those. And I saw it come up from S sister Lisa. And then it said, you should watch this 10 minute video. I'm like, it's 11 o'clock at night. I'm not watching a 10 minute video. So I watched it three times and <laughs> I was, I didn't know you were in Minnesota. I had no idea. I and never said my name. Never said her name. And I did thank God for Nancy Drew and reading all those books back in the day, because mm -hmm. I did my Beth sleuthing and I, I, I heard it three times. I watched her three times and I heard you say you, your, your kids is Facebook. Um, yes. And so I went and found that. And then I dug to see who you were. And then I found you. And actually this is really funny that we're talking about this right now, Deb, because just it's within the last two months, you and I, I had sent it to you. I, I found the initial message that I sent to her and my message is like pretty much like, I, you know, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. Just watch your video. The Lord, Holy spirit has put this on my heart 
I don't know who you are, but we need to talk. And I have a friend named Laura Sobiak. I really think you need to meet her, blah, blah, blah. And then we got on the phone, I think like two days later. And I, I was in my kitchen. I got my whole kitchen cleaned because we yeah. talked to her. And um, I remember your voice. You you barely had a voice. And then I, I it was, was where I, car I carried my grief right here. So yeah. like with Keely, my grief, I lost all kinds of weight. I was just like, I couldn't eat, couldn't drink. Tyler, I carried, I, I didn't get but I, I carried all my grief so it was almost two years other than that video which sounded pretty dang good that i really struggled talking yeah and even and so and then i remember saying to you you've got to come to this wine event we're having and you know come early and and come be with these women you're, you're like this is crazy i mean we probably think i don't know this woman she's making me do this stuff but there was, it was just so evident. I, I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me, you are going to be working with this woman. I had no, even though you said Ufta, I had no idea you were in Minnesota. <laughs> I, well, that should have been my, as Nancy Drew, that should have been my number one yeah, clue. I said, but, I don't even say Ufta. I know. But what was also really weird with that is that I, we, I live in Alexandria now, but at the time I lived down in Sleepy Eye and we have a lake home in Alexandria. So we were up at our lake home which we were hardly ever up here and we had company like we had people up here when she asked me to drive to minneapolis to at lord no where was it lord Flood? Yeah, it was some it was in bloomington so you had to drive two hours in, oh, in and, then, and then there was a right and then but i'm like i go i i can i have but then i kept thinking i was supposed to go to that so then i did go to that and it was um honestly it was like life changing and Barbara Heil spoke at that one. But I remember we, you know, we got together at the restaurant, uh, a few of us, you and Sharon and I, a few of us, just ahead of time. Laurel wasn't even there. Laura Sorbiak was never even there, never even met her. And her son, Zach, had died. So I thought, oh, this will be a good connection that, you know, she and I, you know, maybe she she can help me in my grief. I was thinking that. Um, and then I went into that um banquet room and they were laughing and drinking wine and having fun and hoo -hoo and um singing and so and i i remember i thought this it, it was like this this is a catholic it was like a dream come true it's like everything that i'd been to at like you know i'd been to women of faith and set apart i've been to thrive it's like i'd been to all of those things and here i was in in the middle of it and it was in my own faith and that was when barbara heil spoke and she talked about being a cradle catholic and she said um that she she would just point she kind of point blank called us out you know no one ever really told me or invited me to come in you know why because none of them knew anything about their faith anyway and she was right i thought you're talking right to me i don't know anything you're i am a cradle catholic it was right to me and um but it did. It was. And then the women that are a part of wine, they love the Lord so much. Like, that's what I'd missed. That's what I didn't know is that you could love the Lord so much and that your friends could all love the Lord so much and you could all grow so deep together. And there was just so much that I was missing. And you could invite them. You could invite them into a relationship, right? I mean, that's the you beauty could of it. Invite them into a relationship. It made me feel like, oh, you you should be a part of this. You should be a part of this. And um, and then I remember that um, you uh, you you introduced me to Jeff Cavins. I didn't even know who he was. Oh yeah, was, I didn't yeah. even know Jeff. I didn't know that that was that whatever. And so I said to and he, oh, he called me. I was on his radio show on yeah. working for yeah. loss or something like that. And so I called my friend Chris. And I was like, yeah, I did some radio show with Jeff Cavins. She's like, oh, my gosh, do you know who he is? I'm like, I have no idea. She goes, Deb, my gosh, that's just so she had to explain it to me. And then he had invited me to that St. Paul Street evangelization. Mm -hmm. So I went and Chris was going, you know, and, and you were there. And I, I walked in and I walked right by him. <laughs> and just his look, you know, kind of looked at me, you know, and I, so I stopped and I go, are you Jeff Cavins? I, like, yes, I, I go, you know, I heard you're a real big deal. And he started laughing and he goes, oh, and I, you know, and then, so then to, to meet him on, uh, you know, a personal level like that and uh, just the, the amazing thing. Right. I mean, he uses everything on a real quick note. Um, one of the funny things is, we, you know, we get these, um, these God winks 
we'll use because Teresa Tamio's got that great book coming out about God winks, but God gives us these little affirmations. And as we're listening to Deb's story, we hear all these affirmations all the way up to our relationship. And I mean, all of us, you here with us tonight, Allison, all of us together, all of our relationships. Um, but one quick little God wink um, that kind of solidifies the fact that Deb is part of wine and needs to be working with us always laboring joyfully with us in the video. I know, I know, I know. I was in a CC. I was in a CC and staring at the garden where the roses with St. Francis. And also this woman looks, it yells from across the garden, Kelly in a CC. And it was Chris. <laughs> my Chris. Was my Chris. Chris. I'm like, oh my goodness. She's like, I'm like, I'm Deb's Chris. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we have so, we know what we need to do is we need to do a um, uh, Women, Wine, and Wisdom online with you and do just your story, but even so we have more time because ladies, I got to tell you, you are getting a sliver of the pie of what this woman has done and accomplished. <laughs> About um, what this woman has done and accomplished mm -hmm. through wine. And so we say it so often, I mean, it's my story, but it's all of ours that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And mm -hmm. you know, when you said being set apart, that yeah. word, it's, it's consecrate, right? To co consecrate is to be set apart and to think yeah. that, that each of us are, we are set apart for him and for this work. We are consecrated to him. And so, um, man, Deb, I yeah. love you. Thank you, Jesus, for the yeah. snowstorm. I know, I know. And just the last skinny that I just have to give you guys, like just that God working things out. Um, so like Keely and Tyler are not here. Um, and it, I, and I am sad every day. Like there's, there's, no, you know, you don't, uh, you don't lose your grief. You just learn how to live differently with it. And I just bring it with me, you know, wherever I go, there is part of me today as they were, um, Tyler was just seven years ago on March 7th. That was seven years ago that happened. Keely was, will be eight years coming up in this June. And you know, I find you, you find that in your hardships that sadness and joy can walk hand in hand, like they, they walk together. So I am the saddest, most joyful filled person that you're going to find. And I am the most high energy exhausted person. Well, maybe Kelly is, but high energy. I mean, all of, you know, I'm high energy. I'm very exhausted. I'm very full of joy and I'm very sad. And, and just to close out, I, um, had worked for the University of Minnesota Extension as an educator for years. And when we moved to Alexandria, I just knew it wasn't a fit. And I prayed to God that I said, Lord, just allow me to just drive around and pray with people. But I have to get paid because I have to have benefits and stuff. My husband's retired and I have to. And I'm sorry, I wouldn't even ask that, but I have to. Ask and, um, not, right? Ask and seek not. Right, right. And so um, just so you you all know, um, that you have to have uh, degrees in theology and a master's in divinity and all of this uh, to, if you ever do want to be like a chaplain uh, of some sort. Um, but how does a school teacher become the chaplain for a hospice organization and drive around every single day to pray with people and help them on their journey to heaven and then walk with the family afterward, sharing with them how they will survive and taking my hardships to say you can do this you can make it and that the person who is going to heaven that they are that their heart is ready to go uh how does that happen with no degree and uh and even better yet the day that i was hired july 16th my daughter's birthday mm -hmm. yeah and i hadn't worked uh, july 16th for six years because it was so sad that's the day they asked me to start and i was hired a month ahead of time and my supervisor's name is Kaylee. Just, just saying. Yeah. And so that's what I do for a living. I'm, I'm a hospice, spiritual care and bereavement manager. I've done it for three years. Every day, uh, every day of my life, I affirm um, our Lord and the wondrous things that he does and how he, that how he takes our greatest trials and makes the most beautiful, amazing joy and purpose from them. So just count on and know he will never let you down. So Deb, I, I have to ask, because you kind of led into it. So I'm going to assume in this question that Tyler did send you the sign that you had asked for. He did, he did, doggone it. Sometime, you guys, I'll show you those. So Keely, had, hers was a purple petunia. Nothing to do with the petunia itself. 
it, it, but her, it was purple. It came out of nowhere. It was in the middle of, of uh, this flower. It should not have been in this flower bed. It wasn't there. It's epilepsy is purple. And her wedding colors were exactly that purple when it showed up. And then just moving forward, I had dug that purple petunia up and put it in a pot and it grew one year and then it died. And I had the pot outside. I had the pot outside because I was going to put one of Tyler's funeral plants in it. And uh, something started growing. And I said, doggone, that's going to be a petunia. And when it opened, it was white with purple in the middle. Uh huh. And then a purple one grew with it out of the same pot. It was all purple. So I always said Tyler would be just that white petunia with purple. You know, he was very humble, a little classy. He would let Casey take Kaylee take the charge. But then the next year, they started growing out on my sidewalk, like uh, they out of my front steps. They they um once I shared it with people, I can't even tell you the number of people who. Uh, especially the purple petunia, they find purple petunias. And I say, you know what, that purple petunia is not my Kaylee peeking in on you, but that is the Lord letting you know, or your loved one know, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. I said, we're all connected. And people will say that, you know, I was taking my, my son in for alcohol rehabilitation and there was a purple petunia and Kaylee was his teacher. And I just felt that the Lord was saying, yeah, I'm here. I I've got this. And just uh, the, the, the story of the purple petunia is just phenomenal. And uh, yeah, they, they grow still here in my Alexandria home. I didn't plant them just so you know. So mm -hmm. it, it's beyond it, it, this. It's kind of, I always say it's kind of like the Virgin Mary being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Um, you just can't quite wrap your head around that. I mean, there's no logic. There's no logical way that you can make sense of the things that have happened in my life um, without knowing that um, the Holy Spirit has just, it's so evident and it's so amazing. I wish that my kids were here with me, but my life wouldn't be like it is. And that's hard to accept too. And I figured, you know what, I, I wasn't given a choice. I wasn't given a choice. It, it's what happened to me, but I was given a choice of whether I turn to God or I turn and, and, and I turn away and I grabbed onto him full force. And, uh, and he has, he's been dragging me even when I didn't want to. So, yeah. Uh, to kind of to wrap that up, but when you talk about the peace and the, or the joy and, and the suffering going hand in hand, and we know that the resurrection yeah. comes with the cross uh, and Jesus says to us, you know, as so many times we read in scripture that your joy may be complete, that your joy may be complete. And I think as we, even as we're, you know, halfway through Lent and we're entering into, we go into Holy Week and we see the blessed mother to think of this concept that she stood at the foot of the cross. There could be no more suffering. I mean, no greater suffering is what I mean. You know, I mean, this is her, her savior. It's her son. It's her everything has been humiliated, beaten, and murdered. And, and, and she's watching that. And in that incredible suffering to contemplate the joy that she felt at the moment when the one thief turns to her son. Because if we think about what her, what her goal is, what her job, what her vocation is, is to lead us, her children, to Jesus. And when we go to him, no matter what suffering we're going through, whatever it brings us to him, she's going to have such joy. So I think there's such a beauty in that joy. Um, and it's a joy that I see a lot in wine. I see a lot in core groups. I tell people around the country, if you sat down with my core group from Alexandria and you heard their stories, or you sat down with my core group in Minnesota or my core group in Louisiana or the core, my, the core groups here, 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 and you heard their stories, you would look at these women. If you didn't have a faith, you'd be like, why are you even happy? Mm -hmm. And they are so joyful, like you are, Deb. And it's because you you live your faith and you, you have united that suffering instead of becoming angry and bitter, have united it with Christ. So it isn't wasted. And he lavishes you with joy because you ask and seek and knock. And we never even got to the second chapter, but oh my goodness, yeah. this was so good. So Allison, I'll let you wrap it all up. Deb, thank you. Oh my goodness. I am so, I'm so grateful mm. 
to God for the snow. And most Minnesotans don't say that in March. So. <laughs> I'm grateful too. It made me stay home. I was pumped. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, I am so grateful for your time, for your story, for your heart, for having the opportunity to meet you. I was sharing Wednesday night that we were on a retreat. We had gone to a conference, one of the wine conferences, and then there was like a little mini retreat that followed it. And it was very, very early in the morning and I could hear somebody downstairs. And because of my own anxiety, my own fear, I was afraid to spend time with you and to meet you because I had never heard a story like yours and I didn't know how to talk to you. I was overwhelmed and afraid. And I said to the Lord almost out loud, please let it be anybody but Deb. And there was about 30 women in this house. <laughs> Go down and there's Deb. I'm like, really God? <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna teach you something. I want you to sit with her. And we had the most beautiful conversation. And you taught me so much about just listening and, mm -hmm. and God's just God's love. So thank you for being you. Thank you, God, for making it be Deb that day. Do you remember what you said to me? No. <laughs> I'll tell you, because there was oh. two encounters that you said there was two encounters that you had with me. And in that encounter, you said, I'm supposed to tell you that he knows how much you miss your children. You will find him, find them in adoration. You said you will find them in adoration. And so then I signed up for adoration and I started going to adoration and you said that they, they will be there. You need to really go to adoration. And then there was another time when we were in, um, Philadelphia maybe. And we were in church at, we were in church and then afterward you went out to eat with a bunch of people and then later on it was just you and I and you were just kind of like a deer in the headlights again and you said I I um your 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 kids were by you at church you said that to me your your kids were by you at church and and I had was really emotional in church like I was really really emotional and I said I I felt it like I felt that and so those were two really awesome things. And that's to you, you being bold and the Lord saying, and for it to be me, how your anxiety, uh, how you didn't want it, but how badly I needed what you said to me and how much that helped me. So I am, you know, another way that God has worked in, in such amazing ways. Oh, God is so good all the time. And I guess um, you know, that's all I think it's left is for you to, you to close us in prayer. I don't think there's, gosh, just overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed with God's goodness. Would you please lead us in prayer? Sure. All right. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, just thank you. Thank you so much for this time together. Thank you so much for the gift of Kelly and Allison and the way that they continually, even through this pandemic, push forward knowing how badly we all need you, Lord, and just creating so many opportunities for women to come together to feel your presence. And we definitely feel your presence tonight here with us. And Lord, there's a lot of people who are, are online with us. And I just ask you to fill each and every one of them so full of your spirit so that they feel peace. And like this joy that is just, uh, it transcends, uh, they're under, they don't even understand um, this joy and peace that they have and that they just take a, a deep breath in and they, they feel uh, all of your love and your goodness and your kindness and your joy and they know that you're there. And then they just take a deep breath out and they just release any sadness or any fear or doubt or shame or unforgiveness or bitterness or anger, anything that would hold them back from feeling all of the love, Lord, that you have for them. Uh, Lord, we thank you also for dying on the cross for us, for our sins. And as Kelly said, when your mother watched you carrying that cross, being beaten and scourged and whipped and humiliated and nailed and ridiculed, that good could come from that, Lord. And how, how, how his mother could say, oh, God, I know that something good's going to come. But that it was the most precious gift that we ever had, the greatest gift that you could have given us was to be the sacrificial lamb for all of us. And it's because of you that um, this life is not scary because we know that this life is not all there is, that it's just a skip, that there is a kingdom waiting for us. You tell us all the time that when our room is ready, you're going to bring us home. 
So help us to prepare our hearts to ask you to come in, to repent of our sins, to make things right with you, Lord, to make things right with everyone, and just to see the blessings on the day. And if this is the last day you give us, that we make it great. And if you should take us to the kingdom, that our hearts would be ready. And so we thank you and we praise you and we glorify you. And together, in the words our Savior gave us, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh my goodness. I could do this for another four hours. So we're going to have to do something. And I, I had so many great ideas hit my heads, ladies, about oh, no. together to do a little retreat. Allison, look out. Yeah. Yeah. Allison, look out. I have an idea for all those women of wine to do something really special to bring them into kind of that deep, intimate, from the surface to the depth in a retreat that might involve mm. Deb Hadley. Oh, um, wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, yes. I get to meet yeah, all I, these women. Oh my I have god! A, I have a good idea. I know, Allison. Mm -hmm. Allison cringes when I say I have an idea. <laughs> I have a really good idea. Yeah, we have to bring it from a head, the Lord, from head knowledge into our heart, mm -hmm. and so that we feel so secure that when those hardships happen, when the storms of life hit, because they are going to, uh, that we can withstand them, uh, that we don't fall apart, that we don't crumble to the ground. Um, that I, like I did and like we all do. I mean, like we don't crumble because we know that we get knocked down, but boy, I, I, sur I surely felt him when he picked me up and he carried me through and, um, I trust him and we, there are going to be more losses. I am going to have more losses, um, in my life. We all are going to have more losses. We are, I, there's going to be more hardships and, um, to not be afraid of that and just know that, yep, there will be, but Lord, I'm going to count on you to carry me through. Because you're all, you're all that I have, and Amen, sister. Amen. Woo all right, ladies. I Can we just do a mic drop after the prayer? I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right, ladies. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you, Allison. Always thank you for all your hard work. All of you who are with us tonight, thank you so much for being part of wine. I, we appreciate it so much. Uh, make sure you're over on our website, catholicvineyard.com, that you're signed up as a wine member. As mm -hmm. Allison said earlier, your memberships get you good discounts. Um, sign up to get our emails. Our, our The post this morning was phenomenal by Angela Koenig. If you haven't had time to read it, go, there she is, is the title of it. Go read it. I'm going to steal mm -hmm. every word of it because it's so good. Um, but there's so many other great perks you get. And tonight is just one of them to be with these beautiful women. So mm -hmm. please come be part of wine. This is what keeps us flowing. We are a little nonprofit and we depend on you. So this is great. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Say we're a little nuts. I thought you're going to say we're a little nuts. We're, little nuts. we're a little nuts and a little nonprofit. We're nuts, we're nuts yeah. for the Lord. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right, you guys have a great, have a great week, everyone. And uh, we will see you here next week. God bless. Bye.